try this thing, stratify as much as you can. No. no. Well, stratification certainly no. helps. That, that's, but that's one way. I mean, if you're, if no, it's not. You can use no. all the no. fair information. No, no, no. 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 You generally can't stratify because there are too many, there are too many X's. Um, and so you very quickly run into these cells. Um, okay, so you have the dimensionality and Well, you could call it that, but I mean, maybe you know. No, but it's only if you're, no, but I mean, there's a curse of dimensionality is if you're trying to make knowledge out of nothing, you know, that's the curse of dimensionality here. It's not something specific to cause, it's refusal to commit yourself to any prior knowledge. Um, and that, you know, the trial, in a sense, promises to load of that, but it does not. Now, of course, you can do this mechanically, and Max Casey and Harvard has a paper um, based on sort of mechanical standard priors. So if you don't want to do this, um, you can use one of these standard priors that are used in machine learning, and that will give you an algorithm, and you can get the code from Max Casey, and he's reanalyzed the Texas, uh, Texas the Tennessee Star Experiment, and he gets about a 15% increase in precision um, from just using the standard prior. So there's technology out there for doing this in the first Yeah. Maybe it's a related question, but so if you don't have all the non-founders, yes. then you want to move to an elimination the last step, because this is the only thing that's helpful, otherwise you can have the founders around no. here no. that are going to no. generate selection. No, no, no. <laughs> Well, it, it's true, it'll generate selection, but there's nothing you can do about it. And randomization doesn't help. All it does is decrease precision. You're going back to the quotes I gave you. It's, it, randomization doesn't do that. You mean in terms of precision? Well, or in terms well, are you planning to do this experiment a thousand times? You only care how close to the truth you are. I don't think I'm biased, but I see that thing at all. I know this sounds strange, but... No, no, but conditional and precision, I have a Sure, but I don't think that's um, doable. Um, what does it mean, conditional and precision? I mean, the way you see people do it the other way around. They say, we will only look at unbiased estimators, and at minimum there is unbiased estimators. And that's giving away the story. I have no interest in bias, unbiasedness, if it costs me in terms of being away from the truth. And if it kills patients, which we were talking about here, I mean, you go loss function, you want to minimize the loss function. Yeah. Uh, you can, I have no interest in the unbiasedness. I have no interest as long as I can balance on the bias. Because, I mean, the good thing about zero bias is that that's the only bias you can know. If it were not zero, then you would just you know, you know it's one, one that you would remove one. But, but oh, one. if you knew what the bias was, you could correct it. So if that's it, not an interesting so, so you, you know that you'd be unbiased? No, not at all. Um, because even if you knew what the bias was, you wouldn't necessarily want to use that on, you, you still wouldn't want to use the corrected estimate. So I don't see the point of it. Well, the, the point is that the, the, the problem is that when you, if you accept estimators that are potentially biased, yeah. uh, if the bias is very large, so if you buy, if, if you say, I don't care about the bias, I can trade it off against variance, but for well, that you need to be sure that the bias is going to be. No, you don't. That's wrong. Because you're minimizing the loss function. If you minimize the loss function, that's it. Which and is that the of information on the size of the device, the maximum size of the device. No, Otherwise, no, the loss function. No, no. But the device is increased and the loss function. Um, that's not necessarily true because there could be. No, because your priors will wait out those regions of the support, um, which um, you would. So, unbiased doesn't help. Um, you're using prior information here and you're not going to get the right one. It doesn't lead to those rules. I agree with you that if you do one of these expected loss calculations, in general, it's going to be unlikely that you're going to be, you know, that's going to be very biased. But it's a point of principle that we don't want to bind bias or do anything like that um, because we're maximizing, you know, expected utility here. Now, Banerjee et al. justify randomization. Um, in a non-standard, non-expected utility framework by writing down an ambiguity of this utility function. Um, and this, that what they argue, and I think this is correct, is that this is appropriate if you're trying to persuade people who don't trust your prior information. So if people say to you, you cannot use any prior information, um, and we will not accept it. And I believe that's probably correct for a pharmaceutical company that's trying 
you know, the synthetic opium pill with which they're planning to addict the whole American population. Um, but um, I don't think it's appropriate in scientific endeavor. Now, as they point out, I'm taking this from their paper, it's not mine, you can't even use your last randomized control product because your last randomized control product, um, and what's more is you can't even defend your randomized control trial ex post because someone can go through your randomized control trial and like Fisher say all the plots are on the left hand side of the field and we know that even before you did the experiment things grow better on the left hand side of the field so you know if you by chance get a bad balance um, then your RCT can always be bad so people will agree to your randomization ex ante but it doesn't protect you ex post against them saying your randomized control trial is not good. Also. Yeah, I think I understand uh, this uh, theorem, but I think it would help a lot if you were to give uh, a simple example of the kind of prior that, uh, an example if you know the kind of prior that you'd like to use, and why in that case, uh, the randomization is not good. Well, they give an example in the paper, which is a very good one, I think, which is that someone has a theory about a particular educational thing, and they know they have a very, very strong prior that this kind of education only works for very smart students, and it won't work for dim, dim students. So if they have a dim student, then they would learn the most by putting the dim student into this new educational thing. And you only need a sample of one, and they're completely persuaded. Right? If you randomly allocated that dim student to the two groups, then half the time you won't fight out of it. So it, it's that sort of thing. The other thing is, you know, what we used to do in economics was the hypothetical deductive method. We used to say, you know, if you prod this here, that is what you will find. And, you know, this is very much compatible with it. I mean, it's a pretty, it's not general, but it's, it's a very interesting way of thinking about how to acquire knowledge. <coughs> but you have to use that prior information in order to do the crucial experiment. It's what David Friedman calls an acid test. I mean, it's a test which the result is going to tell you one way or the other um, which way the ground um, lies. Just a parenthetical note here, I'm sort of running out of time, um, and I do want to talk about standard errors. Um, Non-randomly, you know, how do you, uh, they say in the paper you can allocate them any way you like. Well, the trouble is, how could you possibly rank them any way you like? You know? You have a list of maybe you just have them marked by numbers, but where did those numbers come from? Those numbers have a cause. That cause could conceivably be correlated with something else. Even random number generators have causes. You know, they're replicatable things. And in fact, there's literature on what randomization means, and there really is no such thing. Um, I'm not sure this is really important in this context, but nevertheless, it, you can go down that rabbit hole. Right. I think if you mentioned one example of being efficiency. All of this stuff seems very much open to simulations, where you can simulate various priors, you can simulate a whole variety of things, and it seems like that would just, you know, put this right out there, and, and you could understand the efficiency. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, that's what Casey does in his paper for this particular experiment, for instance, and I think it would be useful to do that for a lot of experiments. But, you know, Casey's thing is a mechanical solution, and it's saying there are mechanical solutions which give you better answers here. But, you know, the, the example of the school teacher is a better one in some sense because it's sort of saying, you know, maybe it's a good idea to think and not randomize. Um, and, you know, that, and that you may be able to learn crucial things in the way that we used to do traditionally um, without necessarily following that. So let me, um, and this is probably all I'll get to, but let me say something about standard errors. So, you know, I've emphasized all along that these balance problems, you know, are. You, you still should get, you know, if you're way off, you should know it's way off because you have some idea of could that have happened by chance. Um, so w when I first got interested in this about 10 years ago, I made up this very simple case and I got such weird results and no one could explain them to me. I just put them in a drawer because I thought I must have made a mistake and everybody else thought I must have made a mistake too. So here's what I did. I simulated a population of treatment effects in which each individual um, is log normally distributed, but shifted, so that the mean is actually zero, okay? The key thing here is the skew. You know, there's a long right tail. Some people have really big treatment effects. Most people have small negative treatment effects, and over the whole population, they add up to zero. 
And reading the microfinance literature suggests it's something like this, that many people, if you give them money, will just fritter it away, whereas there are one or two blatant Bill Gateses in your microfinance group, and if you catch one of those, they'll get fabulously rich, and you know that will compensate for all the people who don't do anything. So what I'd done in this simulation was the population average treatment effect is zero, but I was getting significant effects 20, 30, 40% of the time. And, and I thought, you know, I must have done a coding error. And I was getting bimodal distributions of average treatment effects. And so it looked really seriously weird. And I'm not doing anything except taking two, the difference between two humans. And the problem here is the outliers. And if you have this very skewed distribution, there are very heavy, there are people with very large possible values out there in the tails. And if, let's say that you have a microfinance group and there's a study sample which has one of these financial geniuses in it, if they're in your control group, you're gonna get a small negative effect, very precisely determined. If they're in your treatment group, you're gonna get a huge positive effect, but very ill-determined. Now, more generally, skewed treatment effects are problematic, and there's an old theorem, which, and I owe huge discussions on this to my colleague, Ulrich Muir, who understands these things the way that I do. There's a famous theorem from 1956 by Bahadur, Bahadur and Savage, that's Jimmy Savage, um, who showed that without some, it's a remarkable paper, it just says that t-statistics don't work. Um, and that the t-statistic for me um, is wrong, unless you put further assumptions on the underlying distribution of things you're getting meaningful. And those assumptions essentially restrict the third moment um, of the underlying distribution. So it's actually fine if you're um, symmetric. So if the treatment effects are symmetric, you're okay. But if they're asymmetric, you have a big potential problem. And the proof of this theorem basically says you can always find an outlier large enough to invalidate inference, no matter how big the sample size. So you say, I'll give you a sample size of 100 million, and in return, you can pick an outlier big enough to screw up um, the inference. Ironically, and there really is a deep irony here, the median treatment effect would be fine, because the median treatment effect is not affected by outliers but a randomized controlled trial cannot deliver the median treatment of that. So you've got this sort of problem, which is you'd really like to do robust F inference, um, which would work with medians, but an RCT won't do that. You're stuck with the mean, and the mean is a statistically ill-behaved object in the presence of skew. Um, and you might say, well, you can unskew by take logs, or you can trim. You can see you have this outlier. But you know, if you're doing cost-benefit analysis, you can trim, and you know, actually one of the practical cases I was going to talk about is if you go back and look at one of the most famous experiments in economics, which is the Rand Health Experiment. The Rand Health Experiment has a huge outlier. Um, what a dark month they refer to the million dollar baby. Um, there was one woman who had a baby and she had complications and it cost a million dollars and she was in the treatment, one of the treatment arms um, of this thing. And if you read the detailed background reports, John Newhouse and the guy who's, who's were doing this are terrified of this outlier, right? Because they say, okay, you know, maybe we should take this outlier out because it's screwing up everything, right? And they say, well, if we take the outlier out, it's people like that who determine whether healthcare works or not, right? That tells you whether the insurance is going to go bankrupt or not. You think of Obamacare, you know, most of us don't spend any money, but it's the people who are out there in the tail that are really costly. So if you're doing a randomized controlled trial with cost-benefit analysis in mind, you can't trim, nor can you take logs, because the average of logs is not what you want to know. It's the average of money you want to know, not the average of log money. So, you know, there are cases where that wouldn't be a problem. You know, you're just doing science or something. But a lot of this is actually thinking about cost-benefit analysis. And actually, I think I've said what happens here. You get a my bottle distribution of average treatment effects depending on where the outliers are. Um, when they're in the treatments, um, you get a lot of dispersion. You get a big positive effect, but very small t-values. And when they're in the controls, you get a very tightly determined negative value. 
Um, so the tests are actually biased against microfinance, if you think of this as a microfinance. So you're going to find typically um, negative results, um, and significant negative results, even though the true uh, mean in the population is actually um, zero. So I talked a little bit about the health experiment. What Joe Newhouse and they do, they, and his co-authors do when they did that, is they switched from randomized, well, they did the randomized control trial, but they analyzed it using Tobits and other structural methods in order to limit the effect of this outlier on the results. And modern analysts, um, including JPAD analysts, have actually made a lot of fun of them for saying they had no idea how to do modern econometrics, but they actually had a very good idea what they were doing. And this outlier was the reason that they were really worried about that. So let me finish with, there's, I've only started on the t values here. Um, there's an old issue that goes back to Fisher, um, actually, and it's called the Fisher-Barron's problem. And the way medics and economists don't think of it this way, but that's actually what they're doing. Um, <coughs> they do the two sample <coughs> t-test. So you have the difference of means. Um, you have the sigma squared in one group, the sigma squared in the other group take sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2 and um, take the square root of it and calculus is standard error and you divide your estimate by that with two sample t-test and that's actually what you get if you do a regression um, with robust standard errors with point robust uh, standard errors. Um, now there's a new paper by Alan Young at the LSE who's argued, well wait a minute, sorry, I didn't say the fish burnings when running out of time. Um, what fisher Barrens showed is that this, this difference in means divided by the two sample standard error gives you a t-value that is not distributed as t. Um, and that's the fisher Barrens um, problem. And in fact, Excel has the fisher Barrens distribution built into it. The fisher Barrens is, there's another parameter, which is the ratio of the two means and the treatment of the sorry, the ratio of the two variances in the treatment of the control groups. And so you have to add that additional parameter onto the t-distribution to get the fisher variance um, distribution. Um, if the um, variance is zero in one of the groups, which can happen if you kill all the patients, for example, um, then the t you have to half the number of degrees of freedom in the t-value. So, uh, you know, the t-value's got much thicker tails than you think it does and you're going to get the wrong inference when you do that. So Alan Young has this new paper, and it's just an amazing piece of work. Um, and you know, Alan likes to bury himself in some incredibly complicated problem and come out four years later with something that's often extremely interesting. Um, so he's, what he, he doesn't call it the fisher variance problem, but that's what I think it is. Um, and if you put covariates in, so if you do a regression with the treatment dummy and with a bunch of X's in there, that makes the fisher variance problem much worse than it can do. And these are standard problems actually with, the, <coughs> with quite standard errors um, that you can get um, misleading influence there. And what he did was he took all the experimental papers in all the American Economic Association journals um, and got the data from the authors the authors answered queries for him, and he's got 53 experimental papers there. Um, there were about seven, which was surprisingly low, where he couldn't even get any of the tables that were published in the papers from the data that's enclosed with the, the papers. Only seven, I mean, that's pretty remarkable, actually. Um, and so 53 experimental papers, he can reproduce the results in the paper. And what he does is, test the null hypothesis that all treatment effects are zero in each equation or in all the equations in the paper. Um, needless to say, all of these papers have significant effects in somewhere in the regressions or in the paper. And depending, what he does is he uses the Fisher exact method, or sometimes called randomization inference, um, which gives you exact inference um, on these things. And it turns out that in between 25 and 50% of 53 experimental papers, there are no significant results whatsoever. Um, they're all spurious inference. Um, so, yeah. One thing I'm wondering, what specific your hostages here? So it's 
Nothing. Nothing. Just nothing. Nothing. Right. No, but I mean, the, the issue, I should have said that at the beginning, so this question comes up all the time, um, which is that, um, you know, the, 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 the um, target that we're attacking here is this idea that um, RCTs are exempt from the econometric problems that have um, troubled people for a long time. And they're not. And they have specific problems of their own. Um, and that's really all. And the two sample, some of this is a, the two sample problem I was talking about before, the Fisher Barron's thing, is a specific RCT thing. Because if you build a structural model, you can estimate median, you can estimate percentiles, you can do a lot of stuff that's not subject to this particular So, I mean, if you want to positive methods, then all methods have their problems. But there's no, you know, what I would resist to the death is the idea that all methods have their problems and RCTs always have less, because that's nonsense. Anyway, so just let me finish saying this so that, um, but this is pretty serious. I mean, it means that, you know, a very large fraction of these papers are just wrong. And, you know, I remember talking to Penny Goldberg when she was at the PBA, yeah, and she says, I, you know, I, she builds structural models, and she says, you know, I work on these structural models for years, and after four years' work, if I get one key value that's significant, you know, I, I'm really pleased. And these RCT papers come in and they've got significant key values all over the place. Well, it turns out a lot of these significant key values. It's not model search. It's not anything bad like that. It's just that the key values don't work. And the key values don't have the key distribution. Um, and, you know, multiple hypothesis testing is part of that. And it's also clear that in the best experimental papers, now people are taking multiple hypothesis testing seriously and trying to adapt techniques. So that would be better. Now, um, Alan. Alvin Young thinks, that's going to be my last slide, um, Alvin Young thinks that if everybody did randomization and inference, RCTs would be fine. And I think it would be better to do that. But there's a problem, which is the randomization inference does not test the hypothesis that most people are interested in. So randomization inference tests the hypothesis that every treatment effect is zero. Right? So that means that the experiment did not do anything for anyone. Right? So what, when you construct a randomization inference, you say, well, the, the treatment of, you know, the kind of factual under treatment and under controls are the same for every unit. And then you construct how much variance you'd expect to get from the randomization alone, and you compare that with what you've got. So that's fine if you're testing that hypothesis. But if you're testing, say, Oregon Healthcare, and you're worried about Obamacare, you want to know on average what the treatment effect is. If you're doing cost benefit analysis, once again, you want to know what the mean is, um, and you want to test the mean being significantly different from zero. You might have thought that if you can't reject the hypothesis that they're all zero, then it must also be the case the average treatment effect is not zero, but that's not true because inference works, doesn't work that way. I mean, we're only used to, you know, you find lots of significant t values. Um, but the F statistic for regression as a whole is not something so, you know, the inference works that way. Okay. Last thing, I just wanted to say a word about blinding. Um, and Nancy has been very, very keen on this, as they are in some subject. Um, most economic experiments are not blinded, um, so people know which arm of the experiment um, they're in. But, so, what you're trying to get from randomization in these, you know, expected values to bias, unbiasedness, is that you've got orthogonality to cover it. Um, but non-blinding may violate exclusion restrictions. So if you think about what, you know, people know they're in the experiment. <coughs> so it could be that they're responding to any number of things in the experimental conditions, what sort of room they're in, you know, um, just being in the experiment. And, you know, if you read the medical literature, especially the psychiatry, the literature in psychiatry, um, where you know these things are really hard to measure and they're not very objective and so on. Um, there, there's maybe I just wrote some of these names down here that are familiar, but there are hundreds of terms for the various biases that come from this sort of effect. And without blinding, people may um, simply tailor their effort, their cooperation, whatever, to their status in ways that have nothing to do with the treatment. Tall. So how do you get rid of that? Well, you assume it isn't there. And that's exactly like an exclusion restriction in instrumental variables. I mean, 
you say the instrumental variable is not correlated with my error term, and you say, well, I do an unblinded experiment, and I assume that it's only the treatment that has any active effect. I and mean, that's an assumption you have to make, but there's no basis for it, and or no general basis for it. You have to, that's, I don't want to say no basis. You have to argue that on a case-by-case -case basis. In some cases it's plausible, in some cases it's not plausible. But I think in economics, we have not given anything like enough attention. And the hard, the, you know, the hardcore guys say that the analysts, you know, the people who analyze the results of the experiment should be blinded um, too. Um, so should the data collectors, so should the graders. So for instance, um, you know, in psychiatry, when the patient comes in and they do a bunch of very loose sort of tests, it's how does this patient function, then the person who's doing that grading should not know whether the experiment, whether the person is in the treatment or the treatment either. And if you violate that, there's just all sorts of terrible things going on. And I'd recommend, once again, Kramer's book um, for wonderful examples of how you that systematically goes wrong, and the pharmaceutical companies manipulate it, uh, and so on. Maybe, but it's really serious. Problem. All right. I'd be happy to take questions on the other three hours. Um, uh, this is slide number 25. I have, I think, 65 slides. Uh, if I were Jim Hackman, who I would like to imitate, I would say, all right, I only have five minutes, and I would actually get through the other 65 slides. Um, but, you know, it's too hot in here already, and uh, I'm going to stop. But I, I'd be happy to answer questions for some Okay, thank you very much, Angus, for this uh, very dense, provocative, uh, and uh, very, very thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not sure that I really got uh, everything about what you said, but uh, I'm sure that uh, in uh, the room there are many people who like to get some clarification, some explanation, who have some uh, argument to, uh, to put uh, against you. I, I would just suggest incidentally, I know my own history on this, that almost nothing in this paper I would have accepted 10 years ago. And it's taken me 10 years of persuasion and hard fault um, to change from the mind on much of this. So I do, I think, understand where I'm going to So you understand that it will take a little more than a few seconds. To, uh, it takes time. I mean, you have to think through these things and try to okay, it's 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 okay, I would like to, yes. I can only hear you. Hi. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I have a clarification question on the pragmatics of um, using prior knowledge, because I, I didn't really understand that. Um, especially on the answer to why stratification is not um, an appropriate way to going about it. And if I understood you well, uh, if Get back to the example of uh, dim and bright students. If you expect um, a treatment to work well for one uh, part of uh, your your sample, you should put all these in the treatment. Is that is that it? Or yeah, that's okay. I mean, it's that sort of thing. I mean, the details that I don't care about. But um, it's just that it's, it's the construction of what David Friedman used to call an acid test, which is, you know, if, if, if you've done enough work on the theory, meaning you have shaped what you know into an acid test, meaning, you know, we put one person in here or two people in there and one in the other thing, we're going to basically disprove, falsify what we believe. You know, so the, the example I gave, and I forget whether it's exactly the one in the paper, is that you believe this new treatment will only improve the test scores for really bright students. So if you put a really dim student in that environment and their test scores improve, then you've falsified your hypothesis. And you've learned a lot. So, you know, that's what we used to do in economics. We used to, you know, the first part of the paper was along the development of theory, and the point of developing that theory was to get to some testable point at which the data would reveal everything, hopefully by not having to do anything too complicated. 
I mean, I could give you examples from economics that I think would really take too long. Um, on the stratification, I'm all in favor of stratification. I'm not against stratification at all. Um, and the, the problem with stratification is, as anyone discovers when they try to do it, um, you, can't strat you can't use all the information. You know, because let's say you have people's incomes, for instance, and you don't really know how income works, and you might have 2,000 different values, then you can't stratify on the sample size of 100 into 2,000 different values. For example, now you might decide to just split it up into two, but then what are you going to do about education and what are you going to do? And it's just that when you do your stratification matrix, you've got a lot of empty cells in there. And remember what you're doing with stratification is in each strata, you're doing a separate experiment. And so you need enough sample size in each cell in order to be able to do this. That, that's one of the big attractions of re-randomization, that even when you can't stratify, you can keep re-randomizing until you get the balance that you think you need. So re-randomization is possible in a lot of cases where stratification is not. So that's why re-randomization has gotten a lot of attention in the literature recently of a lot of people. Yeah. Luke? I'm not against that either. I'd like to, to follow up uh, on this question of the example because uh, I'd love, you know, in some cases not to randomize and do something else and if I can get precision, I would be happy to do that. But I cannot think of any real life example where really what about case for example? Well, he doesn't randomize at all. Okay, and, and so and so in his case, I mean, it, yeah. So so I don't know exactly what he does, but the paper is published. Okay, okay. So I, I guess I have a look at, at that paper. But yeah. so, so you claim it's generic enough that it can be replicated in other countries? No. Well, I mean, yeah. but but it, the, there are two insights I had, which I got from you. This paper is new, and so I, I don't know if so well to hear maybe you come and defend it, but um, the, the two things I took away from this is, one is, you've got to use your prior information. And you know, a lot of um, hardline randomizers will not let you use prior information. I mean, they really think that's unclear, um, and you shouldn't use that. And that, I think, is appropriate, and that comes out of their second theorem, um, which is, if you don't trust that prior information, you know, because the pharmaceutical company says to you, and say, we know how this drug works, and so we did this test, and given what we know works, this proves that it works, and you say, get the hell out of here. You know, we want to see something in which your hands are completely above the table, and the randomization will do that for you. But, I mean, the problem is it's very hard to construct a scientific research program from that, whereas, you know, using your prior information is exactly what you want to do. You want to test it piece by piece, you falsify. You know, that's what we used to do in economics. And so it's pretty general, you know. So again, I could give some of these examples in economics where I think we learned a huge amount. You know, my favorite example is Hall's test of the permanent of hypothesis, for instance, in which he came up, you know, he used the standard theory to develop a proposition that almost 100% of the profession would have said, if you take that to the data, it will fail. And he took that to the data and it passed. And we just all fell off our chairs. You know, it's just sort of an amazing um, thing. You can also just set the world on fire sometimes with a single number, which is just a mean or something. So, you know, there's lots of ways of changing what people think, which is what we're talking about here, without ever having to random. Other question? <coughs> yes, Mark. So if I can get back to a discussion that started uh, lately in the talk about the fact that m many of those observations apply equally to non-randomized uh, uh, econometric methods. But not all of them. Yeah. Okay, so I understand that in particular the case here, but uh, we would need to, to have read the case paper to discuss this uh, properly. But many of them do, and, and you seem to, your point then was that um, okay, but some people believe that RCTs are a sort of miracle that is going to uh, uh, bypass the rules of st statistics. No, right? I don't think that. I mean, I, 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 but let me just answer like yeah. this. It's a good uh -huh. point, and it would, I would have come to it later. Um, I think what happened to us all was we spent years arguing about identification in seminars, and you know whether your instrument was valid or not. And I think people saw randomized control trials as a clean way around that problem. So you wouldn't have to argue about instruments anymore. 
if you want to read how that's not happened, read the Worm Wars papers, you know, in which the, the papers in epidemiology and economics that are swirling around the Kramer and the McGill paper, and no one can agree on anything, you know, and it's just turned into a huge morass. And um, I always thought that paper was wrong, so my position's been clear from the start, and I published that. Um, but um, it, it hasn't solved those identification problems at all. Okay, but that, that's sort of a different point, right? Your point is that, okay, I'm happy with them by its nest, but it's not quite enough, and there's a number of other issues in statistics, and RCT are not going to solve by miracle those other issues. So, I mean, and then your point is that some people tend to believe that, that this might be true and uh, have misconceptions. Um, so, so then, if this is the case, there's a targeting issue because uh, your paper is fairly technical, so I'm not sure they're going to... They're gonna, and those guys who believe that RCTs can overpass all, 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 all of those constraints uh, will not uh, understand much of, of your paper. So I, I, I don't know if, and if you need to convince us, I think we're pretty much convinced of, of that point already. So I, I, I wonder what is really the target uh, of, of the paper, the way, the way it stands. Um, now, if, if we are convinced by this, then the second step is, the important question is really a choice question. Whenever uh, you can imagine running an RCT, what are the situations where you should rather do an observational study? Um, and I'm not sure this is entirely clear or, 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 or stated in very practical ways. And for instance, one of the discussion that you have at the beginning over precision, and, and, and it's a very fair point that that unbiasedness is useless if the estimator is very imprecise, then we don't care about unbiasedness. This is a very fair point, but if you look empirically at, 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 at the literature, the precision in RCTs is about the same as the precision in observational studies. So they're sort of being on the same ground, and uh, uh, I, it's not clear where the arbitrage is here. So, no, we don't so, so they, they, okay, my point is the, it's very theoretical, and, and it would be useful to have more examples or, or practical points to help us choose when we should move or not. Yeah, well, I didn't, I didn't get to the second part of the paper. I mean, there are RCTs in the Quarterly Journal of Economics with five observations. You know, it's just nonsense. It's not outliers, right? Well, they sure <laughs> are. I wish they were even further outlier. You know, they were outside the journals altogether. I mean, you can always get precision, more precision by increasing sample size. So the issue here is that there's nothing inherent in RCTs which gives you precision. And then, you know, your precision, no, but your precision is wrong because the inference doesn't work. And that's, that's the problem. So in the presence of skewness, and you know, half the papers out there are getting the wrong answer. And these are done by skilled people and they're very major. No, of course. Yeah, no, 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 that's right. But the, the fisher burns problem is not a general problem. I mean, there are special problems in confining yourself to means, um, which complicates the inference a lot. And RCTs confine you to means. So that's an animal that belongs in the RCT zoo and is not somewhere else. Um, though, of course, it's true that people are taking standards of means all the time, and they're sometimes getting the wrong answer. Yeah. There is a big trend in the RCT papers to do as well. Of what? Content treatment effects as well. So you have further assumptions, etc. Sorry, you, I did. You need content treatment effects as well. No, you can't. That's but false. You need further assumptions. No. You need other assumptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there are absurd assumptions. You're assuming that the experiment doesn't change the rank of people. Well, no, but I mean, you know, this is insane because you're doing this RCT to avoid making assumptions, and then you make a preposterous assumption in order to get quantum well, treatment effects. Yeah, but that's not the, that's the last assumption I would make, you know. I mean, the, the idea that the RCT just shifts everything to the without changing their order, I mean, come on, tell me why that would happen. Yeah, but the RCT doesn't change the order, but it doesn't change the order. Yeah, but the RCT doesn't change the order, but Sorry, I'm, 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 treading, I'm, treading, I'm treading on toes, but um, you know, if you want to get quantile treatment effects out of RCTs, you're going to have to make some assumption like that. But you know, the idea that RCTs are credible because they're not making assumptions, you're just throwing it right out of the window when you do that. Um, so, but it's true, we're going to have to address multiple audiences with this. This is not a technical paper by the standard of economics. Um, and there's 
three equations in it or a hundred page paper. So, you know, this is not a really hard. Okay, we, we have time for two questions. Okay. Thank you. I work at IFD where we evaluate public policies and we are very much interested in the heterogeneity of, Im of the impacts. And I would have like to have your, your, your thoughts. Are there other methods that grasp better heterogeneity? And in particular, do quasi-panel methods uh, using the whole bunch of data that we have through yeah. household surveys is a useful uh, ven venue for that? Yeah. Um, you know, that's really was the topic of my earlier paper in the gel. Um, you know, seven or eight years ago, which is that, you know, I do think this search for um, not saying anything about heterogeneity is sort of a recipe for disaster. So you really have to model it. And if you model it, then, you know, you can consider all these other estimators and see whether we do well or not. But, you know, let me reiterate again, I'm not saying that every observational study is any good. I mean, I'm saying that you have to take studies one at a time and decide whether they're credible or not. And you know, lots of RCTs are not credible. And I haven't focused on what I think in many cases is the much more serious uh, uh, you know, problem, which is that these study samples are usually very highly selected. Um, you know, to get them in the experiment, you're not going to be like the target population that you're going to do the experiment on. So you learn something from the, you know, the experiment, but what you learn is has to be modified and translated and transported. And that transportation problem is what the second part of the paper um, is about. And in some of the literature, I think this is diminishing, there is this sort of belief that if you've done the experiment very well, you've discovered the force of gravity or something. And the force of gravity works the same in Kansas as it works in, you know, Nicaragua or something. And so it doesn't matter. I mean, almost all of the debate on the Worms paper, for instance, have been about internal validity. And there's almost no discussion at all in the literature as to whether you would expect it to work somewhere else. My, my um, co-author Nancy has a grandchild, Lucy, who lives in Oxford and has been doing rather badly in school. And she said she read the Worms paper and she decided what Lucy needed was a deworming. <laughs> <laughs> so she gave Lucy, who lives in Oxford, a deworming pill and it didn't improve her grades at all. So um, she was very disappointed in the economics literature. Well, that's of course a joke, but I mean, if you draw a line from Kenya to Oxford, you know, somewhere along that line, these pills are going to stop working. And we'd like to know just where it is and under what circumstances. And you know, that's a really hard problem compared to the problems that we're talking about. I mean, external validity, there's almost no literature on it. Um, it's really hard. And there are some people who do it, some computer scientists. Um, what's his name? Um, Pearl um, has done a lot of work on this. But it's really hard, and I don't think he's got it right. So, um, <laughs> not very inspired to know that. It's not that he's, there's anything wrong with these mathematics, he's just set it up in a way that seems not well suited to you. Okay, I think that uh, we will be, uh, should be close to, to, to ending this session. But uh, as you can see, there are many students in uh, this room. And I'm afraid that uh, with all what you said, you discourage them. No, I'm encouraging them. I'm to, to go ahead with uh, econometrics. They have a hard time learning econometrics. And uh, so, <laughs> in order to conclude, maybe you, you should say one word to encourage them to continue and to uh, work in, uh, in uh, those issues. In well, I'm, I'm not encouraging them to work in randomized control. <laughs> <laughs> It's something else. No, but I mean, I think the way that students should think about this is, you know, if you go back 50 years when I was a young kid, um, <coughs> I remember my colleagues in Cambridge saying, you don't want to run regressions, they're too difficult and no one understands them, right? And then, of course, economists got regressions. You know, they weren't the first to think of them, but they got regression. And people thought, you know, regressions were this magic thing. They taught it to everybody how to do it. And then, of course, if you go to a course in econometrics now, it could be reasonably described as a regression diseases course. You know, you learn all the things that are wrong. The RCT course doesn't have the RCT diseases in it yet. And it needs to have those in there. So that's lesson one. Lesson two is the basic principles of statistical inference are unbelievably important. And that first course you do in graduate school on you know, basic statistics before you do any econometrics at all is maybe the most valuable thing you ever learn in graduate school if you're going to write it. It's just incredibly important. 
and these ideas about bias and precision and trading them off and loss functions and things like that, those are the basic material that you would refer to again all through your professional life. And if you don't have that cold, you're going to be, you, you won't have the adaptable capital that will allow you to change with new techniques as they come along. So that stuff is just unbelievable. Okay, so at least this is a positive uh, uh, lesson. Thank you very much.